Ladies and gentlemen, I can have your attention, thank you. I'd like to um, introduce, with very little ado, our main speaker for the evening, Dr. Richard Lyon, who is a CHSS fellow and is, I hope, going to really excite us and tell us all about his fantastic research work. I know he will. He's a star. Over to you. That'll be, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for the invitation to speak to you tonight. It's an absolute honour and a pleasure. I've been overwhelmed by the stories I've heard already of how everyone contributes to chest, heart and stroke, from running marathons to volunteering to raising money. And if dessert is as delicious as it looks on the menu, I'm not going to keep you for very long because I want to get <laughs> on to dessert as well. I don't work for chest, heart and stroke. I'm a full-time A&E doctor by profession, and normally I work in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary Accident and Emergency Department. And every year, chest, heart and stroke awards a research fellowship, which is a two-year fellowship worth £89,000 to an individual to go out and do some research. And a few years ago, I was awarded that. And what I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about what I did with that fellowship. And you're probably all thinking, what on earth do you do with all of that money? <laughs> and I'll do my best to try and justify it. Ladies and gentlemen, meet John. John's a really nice guy. He's a typical Scot. He's in his late 50s, and he lives in North Edinburgh. John likes his five a day, but he's trying really hard to cut down. He's not impartial to the odd fish supper. And John's highlight of his week is spending the weekend with his grandchildren. And every day, John takes the number 18 bus down the Royal Mile in Edinburgh to work at the university. But today is different. Because today, suddenly and unexpectedly, without warning, John has a massive heart attack. The heart attack is so big, John collapses on the floor of the bus and his heart stops. John isn't breathing. John's heart's not beating. Clinically, John is dead. Meet Andrew. Andrew is your typical 15-year-old who lives in Musselburgh. He's a great lad, he's really into his football, and he drives his mum nuts because he spends all his time on Facebook, will never tidy his room, and never does his homework. <laughs> Andrew, unbeknown to anyone, has a congenital heart problem that means his heart is prone to an electrical dysrhythmia, which can mean his heart can stop at any time. And one day whilst out playing football with his friends in the park in Musselburgh, that electrical dysrhythmia happened. Andrew's heart stopped. Andrew fell to the ground on the park in Musselburgh. Clinically, Andrew, at the age of 15, was dead. Now unfortunately, John and Andrew are not alone. <laughs> because since he got up on Monday, 50 Scots hearts across the country have stopped, suddenly, unexpectedly, <laughs> without warning. This could be you or me, one of our loved ones, one of the, oh, those clearest and nearest at a moment's notice. And of those 50 hearts that have stopped since Monday, just six have been restarted. And sudden cardiac arrest represents the most acute, life-threatening medical emergency that our Scottish Ambulance Service colleagues face. If they don't manage to start the heart at the scene of the cardiac arrest, there's not very little I can do when they arrive in the hospital. And despite some huge advances in resuscitation and medical science over the last decade, just one of those 50 that have their cardiac arrest this week is going to go home. John's chances of seeing his grandchildren this weekend are very, very slim. Andrew's chances of playing on Facebook ever again are very, very slim. And actually, we don't do that well compared to the rest of Europe. In the best centres in Europe, six of the 50 cardiac arrests that happened this week are going to go home. And when I started looking at this for South East Scotland, I was really quite surprised. Because what did I notice? The yellow line shows survival to hospital from cardiac arrest in my region over the last 15 years. And the red line shows survival to going home over the last 15 years. And you see two things. Worryingly, the survival rates are getting worse, 
And even more worryingly, the absolute figures are terrible. 0.7% in 2007. Less than one in a hundred patients was going home in Edinburgh having had a sudden cardiac arrest. So it's no surprise when I went to my bosses and said, I'd like to do some research on sudden cardiac arrest. They said, Richard, what on earth do you want to do that for? They all just die anyway. Well, do they? So we decided to dream up the TopCat study. TopCat stands for Temperature Post-Cardiac Arrest. I know it doesn't quite work. It's a bit of a dyslexic moment, but it was part of it. TopCat is probably the most ambitious pre-hospital study ever undertaken in Scotland. It involved me carrying a pager 24-7 a day, 24 hours a day, and any cardiac arrest in Edinburgh the ambulance service would send me to. Now, I'm lucky that I have the most tolerant girlfriend on the, in the world that tolerated me getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and literally going out to cardiac arrest like this guy in a field to do frontline research. My first top cat call was to Holyrood House, and as I ran through the door, I thought, oh my goodness, what happens if it's the Queen? <laughs> I thought, if I don't manage to revive the Queen, I am in real trouble. <laughs> if I do manage to revive the Queen, that would be really, really cool, but can I put her in my study? <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't the Queen. <laughs> but meet Tracy. Tracy is a really good ambulance service paramedic, and Tracy is the first paramedic that runs onto the bus where John has had his cardiac arrest. What Tracy does in the next five minutes is going to determine whether John lives or dies. And Tracy needs to know about CPR. She needs to know some basic resuscitation science, because in the last few years, we have suddenly understood an awful lot more about what happens to your heart when it goes into cardiac arrest. Bear with me while I talk you through this. This is a CAT scan of what happens to your heart in cardiac arrest. And if you imagine me lying face back down on the scanner and you're looking up through my feet, this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart. And it stops here and it starts flickering away. And if you leave this heart alone, within just a few seconds, this right side of the heart is ballooning up. It's ballooning up so much that the left side of the heart is squished down to immeasurable proportions. Now, you can use your defibrillator. You can do whatever you like to this heart. It's not going to start. If you perform really good chest cardiac massage, chest compressions, without stopping, you can send the heart back up this way into this state when hopefully it may respond to that shock that you're going to put in. Now, the timing of that shock is absolutely vital. You're doing your chest compressions, and you have to stop to put that shock in like you see on television. If that interval between stopping and shocking is three seconds, your survival is still about 100%. You get up to chest compressions, stop, one, two, three, 